Father God, I thank you so much for your word. It is mighty. It is strong. It is our firm foundation. Father, may we more than ever anchor ourselves in to your word. As chaotic as the world is going, Lord, that is our sure foundation. It is the thing that will hold us down in the midst of the storm. Father, I pray right now that you would empty me and you would fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit, with unction from on high, to deliver good food to your sheep like manna from heaven. May your son Jesus be put on display this evening. We pray this in his mighty name. Amen. 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 Genesis chapter 2, as we continue going through the book of Genesis, kind of two main points. Genesis is the most important book in scripture. It may not be your favorite, but it is definitely the most important because it lays the foundation for everything we believe about Christianity, about our faith. It is the foundations of our faith. And when you understand the beginnings, when you understand the book of Genesis, it will illuminate the rest of the whole narrative of Scripture. People who typically have difficulty understanding things that they see in the New Testament or in Revelation, it's usually because they don't have a firm grasp on what the Word of God is and the foundations of their faith in Genesis. And as we're going through, we're looking at Jesus in Genesis. You know, Jesus would challenge the Pharisees and he would say, you, you look at the scriptures thinking that in the words on the page that you have life in them. But the words on the page speak of me. Now, that wasn't speaking of the New Testament because Jesus had not yet gone to the cross. He was speaking to the Pharisees about their Old Testament, saying those words were about him, all about Jesus. And we believe him because God does not lie. Jesus does not lie. So we can find Jesus on every page of scripture if you are looking for him. Now, last time we were there, we looked at day six. We looked at the idea of irreducible complexity about how if you have a, a system with several components in it that are necessary to function, you cannot take out one of those components without losing the function. And that really is a slap in the face of evolutionism because evolution says those components were piecemealed over billions of years. Would not work that way. It's like taking a watch and removing all of the cogs and expecting it to still work. It would not work. We looked at that. We looked at how the Lord defines different kinds of animals and plants, not necessarily by species, but by kind, by general categories of animals. We also looked at the image of God. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? And we likened it to the word kind. Just as everything reproduced after its kind, and that was all throughout chapter one, when he gets to man, to making man, he says, let us make man in our image. In a sense, according to our kind, and not that we are little G-O-D-S, we're not God's, but we are G-O-D apostrophe S, we are his. We are according to his family, we are according to what he wanted to communicate, bear fruit, and and have intimate communion with. So that is what we looked at last week. We also ended by saying we need to see what God sees, despite what we come up against in the world. Now, tonight, we're going to look at day seven. Day seven, or as the, the Hebrews call it, Sabbath, the Sabbath day. We're going to look at the concept of Jesus being our Sabbath. Then we're going to take a bit of a rabbit trail exploring what it means that a day is as a thousand years to the Lord. And is there a prophetic pattern we can glean from creation? We're going to end by talking about our soon coming Sabbath, our soon coming Sabbath. So with that, let's just go ahead and jump into the text. First three verses of chapter two. In fact, you know what? Why don't we back up to verse 31 of chapter one? Then God saw everything he had made. And indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. 
Very simple text, but really profound when we start digging into it. So just to give us a, a, a overview of what we've covered so far and remembering that the Hebrew structure of writing things is to give a broad overview up front and then to give specific details secondarily. We get a broad over, overview of the six days of creation and then right here, the seventh day of creation, the creation week, which is the rest day, the Sabbath day. Then in the rest of chapter two, what we're going to see is the, the details regarding the sixth day and the creation of mankind and everything that pertained to it. It's not two separate accounts. It is one account, but a broad overview in chapter one, kind of like a summary. And then the details about mankind, because remember, scripture was written for our benefit, for our growth, for our edification. So we see him as creator, but then we also see him as intimate creator of mankind so that we get to glean from him. And we're, we're working with the premise based upon sound interpretation of scripture that it was six literal days of creation and a seventh day of rest, literal day, so seven 24-hour periods, and it happened about 6,000 years ago. That will be very important this evening. That flies in the face of what we know from modern evolutionary theory, but that's what the text presents. And we have to make the choice to let God be true and every man be a liar, right? And by the way, those evolutionists weren't there when it was created. So how would they know? It has to remain a theory. But the overview of the six days of creation getting into the seventh day. Again, this will be important. Day one, God created the heavens, the earth, light. Then he separated the light from the darkness. And in doing so, he created all of the dimensionality of our universe, the laws, the forces, the physics that govern our known universe, all within the first couple verses within that first day of creation. Day two, he creates the firmament or what we would call our atmosphere covered by a water canopy, a protective barrier from ultraviolet rays and any things that would come through that barrier. So it's a, it's a protective layer and a layer of oxygen and nitrogen that we can breathe and that plants and animals can utilize, which he hadn't created until day three. Day three is when he let dry land appear and he separated the waters and he created seas and then the land. And as he separated those things, he brought forth vegetation. And I believe when he created the dry land, that's where we got the rocks, the minerals, and all of the ore that we would need necessary in order to make things with metal. Because before the flood, according to scripture, there was metal working. We'll get to that in a later chapter before we get into the flood. Then we see day four, the heavenly bodies were created. The stars, the moon, the sun, the constellations for signs, for seasons that they would point to something. Then we see in day five, the fish and the birds would be created. Those things which would inhabit the oceans, the seas, and those things that would fly in the firmament. Day six, living creatures are brought forth. Animals, creeping things on land, and then man and woman are created. It is followed by what we see here in these first three verses, which should technically, by the way, be part of chapter one, right? Should technically be part of chapter one. That is the seventh day. But day seven, no creating happens. Nothing happens. There's no creation. There's no work. There's nothing that happens on that seven day is complete rest. Creation was completed on the sixth day. But then the Lord extends to the seventh day. Now, as we take a look at verse one in chapter two, it says, thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. By the way, that tells you when Satan was created. It tells you that he was created during the six days of creation. All that is made, seen and unseen, all the hosts of heaven and hosts of the earth were created within the first six days of creation. Verse one tells it makes it plain. I don't know why so many people argue about that. If you just take the text at its surface level, it'll tell you. Now, when was it created? It's not specified. Later on, it's t it tells us in scripture that, that Satan was in Eden. So that means he was around during creation. It also tells us that he sang while the Lord laid the foundations of the earth, which means he had to be there before day two and three. And I believe, it's my conjecture, we'll build on this when we get to chapter three and look more about this character, Satan, that all of the angelic hosts were immediately created when he said, let there be light. 
because we see that angels, the heavenly hosts, are beings of light. Right? We still don't fully comprehend light, but I believe that's when the heavens were, were, were filled with angelic beings when he said, let there be light. And the Lord did not create demons or the devil as they are today. He created only heavenly hosts that would worship him, but there was a rebellion. And we'll get into that again in chapter three. So chapter two, verse one answers the question for you. Uh, creation was complete as of day six with provision for all that inhabits it, which is why in verse 31, the Lord looks upon the creation and says, it is very good, very good. Every other day was good. It was good. It was good. Then very good, very good. The Lord was complete when he made the, the heavens and the earth in those six days, and there was no evil yet, because the Lord said it was very good. And, you know, it's interesting, when he created those things, he also created every necessary attribute that we would need in creation after the fall. We talked about that, how the Lord provides before the need arises. So he's looking at the creation as it was and says, it's not just very good for paradise, It'll be very good until the day I come back and rebuild paradise. So that goodness of God stretches until the millennial reign when his goodness comes down. It was very good. Now, verse two, we see in the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. Now, it says God rested. Does God need to rest? Does he need to take a little nap, go mimis, get some sleep, get some shut eye? Does he need that? No, he does not need that. As a matter of fact, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 says, God never faints, nor does he grow weary. We do. <laughs> he doesn't, which is also encouragement to us because God doesn't grow tired of our requests. God doesn't grow tired of us asking him for uh, provision for our needs or or even of forgiving us of our missteps. Our God doesn't grow weary from work and he does not grow weary of you. Our God does not grow tired. The word rest there is the is the Hebrew word shavaf, which means to cease, desist, come to rest. Not necessarily rest like sleep, but it come to rest like something that's rolling downhill and finally loses momentum and then just stops. That's what it's saying when the Lord rested in the sixth, on the seventh day. It's, he stopped his work. He was complete up until that moment. That is the root word from where we get the word Shabbat or Sabbath. That means that Sabbath day, the last day of the week. Now, I want you to think about this. God did not do anything on this day. Why? Why didn't he do anything on this day? More importantly, why didn't he just turn it into a six day week? And then that seventh day should have been day one all over again. And it's like it's a Monday and we only have Monday through Saturday. Why did God create another expanse of time, another day, another 24 hour period and fill it with nothing? It seems like a little bit wasteful. Because our God has been creating in every single day, utilizing his, his, his great majesty and his creative attributes to fill the planet and the universe with something. And yet he creates a day and lets it pass without filling it with anything. And more importantly, why is this empty day given special distinction? Verse 3 tells us that he blessed it. And he made it holy. He made it sanctified. He set it apart for some reason. You know, Mark chapter 2, verse 27 says that Sabbath was created for man. Man was not created for the Sabbath. God created that seventh day for us. For us. Man on day six was the pinnacle of all of his creative works, every effort he put forth to create the universe as we know it stops with man and woman. And he says it is very good. Then he gives them an extra day and does nothing. A day of peace, a day of rest. So every day previous was laying the foundation for man to come on the scene. And the day after was a gift given to man. The day after nothing was made. The rest day, the Sabbath, is a gift for mankind. It's a pattern to follow. 
We'll see that coming forward when we talk a little bit more in, in Exodus chapter 20 regarding the Sabbath days and how the Jews held to it as part of the Ten Commandments. But it's a pattern that they would follow. And it's a shadow, I believe, of things to come. Now, practically speaking, let's just let's speak practically here. Rest is important. How many of you guys know that? Rest is important, especially when you got kids. Right? Rest is very important. God formed our frame and our functions. He formed them with his very hand, which means his fingerprints. The power goes out. I got a flashlight. We'll keep going. Which means, in fact, let me get that out right now. Just, just in case. He formed our frames. He formed our functions. He knows what we need. So the day after he forms us, he gives us a gift. He gives us a mercy because he knows we would need it. Now, practically speaking, we do need rest. According to the World Health Organization, who I trust about as far as I can throw them, but according to the World Health Organization and the International Labor Organization, uh, l working long hours without rest days has led to 750,000 deaths from heart disease or stroke in 2016 alone. 745,000 deaths because of overworking. Working without a day of, of, of rest actually results in 61% higher hazard rates, on, hazard rates on the job. It means you're more likely, if you don't have that day of rest or don't get adequate sleep, or you've been working too long of hours, that you're more likely to injure yourself on the job by 61% than someone who actually takes a day off or actually just a couple hours off. There is a correlation that was found by the University College of London between obsessive work patterns and alcoholism, depression, mental illness, suicide, and chronic health conditions. And I know the world tells us to be workaholics. You don't get ahead unless you work. You can rest when you're dead. It's not what the Lord says. It's not what the Lord says at all. In fact, he so specifically created your body to enjoy a Sabbath. That every seven days, your body actually has a function where it needs to rest in order to flush toxins out of your body, in order to rebuild lost or damaged cells, in order to recalibrate your internal clock, and, in, and even to give you an opportunity to reestablish a circadian sleep rhythm. Your body actually has a function, and if you don't let it function there, then those toxins build up. Then you end up having more, uh, more chances to get illnesses and viruses. And that just speaks to us because scientists are just figuring that out now. But Jesus said, God gave you a day off. Take it. He created the Sabbath for you. God created you and your body to work for a certain time and then to rest, which shows us that God knows our frame. He knows our needs. He knows what we can and can't do. So if the Lord is saying, sit down, sit down. If the Lord is saying, work a little while longer, work a little while longer. But he knows what we need. And, you know, sometimes we'll get illnesses and the Lord will force us to sit down. He will. I, we, we think about this, right? The children of Israel were in captivity for 70 years because they did not let the land rest. They did not let the animals rest. They did not let the slaves rest. The bond servant rest. They did not let rest come into the land. So the Lord's like, I'm going to make y'all sit down and I'm going to get that rest out of you. And you know how many years they did not rest? How many years of rest they owed the Lord? Seventy. The Lord will tell you to sit down sometimes. He created Sabbath for us, not the other way around. Sabbath, by the way, then means it's not a task. It's not a burden. It's not a scheduled thing. You have to put down a Oh, it's Saturday or it's Sunday. I got to go to church. And then after church, I got to go to this women's meeting. I got, it's not a task. It's not a burden. It was a gift. It's a grace to us. And again, seeing how it benefits us biologically and medically, it's another layer of God's provision. It's another layer. And think about this. This is during a time where they wouldn't get tired because it was perfect Garden of Eden's conditions. They wouldn't get tired. He wants them to rest before sweat would come upon their brow after the fall. Think about that. 
God provides before the need arises. It was a gift to mankind. It's another layer of provision. Now, this comes to the idea of keeping the Sabbath. God made this day holy. He set it apart. He stopped working, and he's telling the children of Israel later on in Scripture, but telling Adam and Eve through pattern, this is what you will do as well. It gives us the structure of seven, which is the number of completion. He is complete. It gives us, and that's one of his fingerprints. We'll talk about that in a second. And then later on in Exodus chapter 20, he even includes it in the fourth commandment. I'll go ahead and read that for you. Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11. The Lord says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days, again, validating it was six 24-hour periods, the Lord made the heavens and the seas and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, because God established that pattern, remember, we have to ask, what is the therefore? Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it or made it holy or sanctified. The Lord, in Exodus chapter 20, ties it as part of the commandments. It's a command to God's people to keep the Sabbath day holy. Now, for those who say, oh, we should keep all of the Sabbath, there's a lot more than just chilling out on the seventh day. It actually, if you go into Leviticus chapter 25, you'll read that he actually established, establishes a Sabbath year. So every seventh year, the Lord establishes something where they would have to give rest to the land. And then the Jubilee year is every 49th plus one year, that 50th year, every seven, seven, right? Or seven, whatever, seven times seven, right? 49th, and then that first, that uh, 50th year. That's called the Sabbath year or the year of Jubilee, where a lot more things rest. So during the Sabbath year, the land rests. That means there's no tilling, but believe it or not, there is harvesting. There's no tilling during that year. You can't plant anything. But anything wild that was left over from last year's harvest that may, harvest that may have gotten in the ground, there's still something there to glean from. The Lord always provides, even in a, in a season of drought, in a season of no tilling. That's, that's what I believe is like hidden manna, where the Lord sets aside something to come to fruit in a year where you didn't plant or where it would have planted in an earlier year. So you could glean, you could not till the ground. You couldn't work the ground. And the Jews got really good at divvying up their land into seven portions where one portion would be resting and the rest of the six would be working. And then they shifted it over and then this one would be working and this one would be rest. And they do that every seven years so that their land would be continuously worked. But they were like, well, a portion of it's resting. The Lord sees the heart. He sees a manipulation in that. But then the Jubilee year, it wasn't just about the land resting. All leases and all mortgages on lands had to return to the rightful family ownership. All debts had to be forgiven. All bonded workers and slaves were set free during the year of Jubilee. So when we talk about the Sabbath and keeping the Sabbath holy, it's a lot more than just going to church on Saturday, which we do anyway, but that's not why we do it, right? We don't do that because we're Seventh-day Adventists, which brings us into the idea of keeping the Sabbath through legalism. What of the Seventh-day Adventist? The people who believe that the true day of worship is on the seventh day. It's, it's, it's on Saturday, Technically, Friday from sundown to Saturday at sundown. So really, just Saturday morning. That's the Sabbath day. So technically, we still don't go to church on Sabbath because we come here after sundown, depending on the day of year. Wintertime, way after sundown, right? (laughs) So the Seventh-day Adventists actually believe that you have to, in order to serve God correctly, you have to worship God and go to service on a Saturday. Now, here's their rationale, because I don't want to just, you know, besmirch their name without giving you their understanding behind it. Their rationale is that the Sabbath day actually predates Abraham and Moses because it was established at creation. It was given to Adam and Eve. Right. During that that pattern was established before the law, before the flood. 
So the rationale is that the Sabbath predates the law. And not only that, all the other commandments, we as Christians are supposed to uh, follow according to behavior, right? We're not supposed to have any idols. We're not supposed to make images of God. We're supposed to serve him and only him. We're not supposed to murder, steal, kill, all of those other things, right? And yet the seventh, the, the going to church on the seventh day or keeping the Sabbath holy, their rationale is that why would you as a Christian not do any of these other things, follow all these other commandments and not follow the fourth one? That's the rationale behind it. And, and it's a pretty interesting rationale. I hear their argument. Um, however, they don't keep the Sabbath either. <laughs> They don't celebrate the Jubilee year. They don't let their land rest or take a year off, a sabbatical, which is where we get that word, right? They don't take a sabbatical. Right? They, don't, they don't follow the Sabbath as the Jew follows the Sabbath. And a few notes on this. By the way, the New Testament never commands Christians to observe the Sabbath in the same manner that the Jews do. Never. Not one place will you find it. In the New Testament, Hebrews 8 makes the argument that we are under a new covenant in Christ that where, where Christ fulfilled all of the tenets of the law. And it says in verse 13 of chapter eight, whereby making the first covenant obsolete because we have a better covenant where Jesus himself becomes our Sabbath day. The Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 gave no instruction to the Gentile believers about keeping the Sabbath. Galatians chapter 4 verse 10 and 11, Paul rebukes the Judaizers thinking that the observance of certain days and certain feasts or the Sabbath brings them justification before God. He rebukes them. Paul rebukes them in Galatians chapter 4 verse 10 and 11. Romans chapter 4 verse 5, 14 verse 5 relegates the regarding of certain worship days as better than the other to a matter of personal conscience. So all throughout the New Testament, we don't see an emphasis on Saturday worship. We don't see it. But more importantly, I want you to, read, I want you to uh, listen to what it says in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 through 14, says this. Sorry. In the wrong place. Galatians 3, <coughs> verse 10. For as many as are, the, uh, are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which were written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for it says the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. No one is justified by the keeping of the law. We are not making ourselves right before God by holding to the tenets of the law. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. That is how we all come to Christ. And we can't keep the law good enough to ever satisfy the holy standard of God. As Paul would say, when he looked at the law, he realized he was condemned by it. Because when he said, thou shalt not covet, he realized there was covetousness in his heart. Covet is not something you do with your hands. Something that comes from the heart. And he's like, I can't fix that. That's not a behavior. That's a character flaw. That's the one that nailed him in the heart, the law was meant to be a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. It was meant to be a mirror that shows you you're dirty. You can't 100% of the time keep 100% of the law in order to satisfy God's need for holiness. You cannot do it. But in Christ, we are now free to live according to the good things of the law, the moral law, what God said is right and wrong. And now he has written those things on the tablets of our heart and we will desire 
to worship him and no other God. We will desire not to make a graven image of him. We will desire to love our neighbor, not murder them or steal from them or take their wife. If the Lord is living inside of you, you will live according to the law, not to appease God, but in response to God's goodness upon your life. It's reciprocal to him. Now, what does that say again about the Sabbath? Does that mean we should not observe the Sabbath and not rest? Not at all. I believe we still need to give the Lord a certain day of the week. Whether it be your Sabbath be a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Friday, you set aside one seventh of your time and you rest. You give to God the time that he gave you. We tend to fill time as if we own it. God gave us time. He's the one who gives us. And again, God gave them that seventh day as a gift. So when you say I'm a packet with stuff to do, you're rejecting a gift of God. So I do personally believe that we as Christians do need to Sabbath. But the New Testament says it's no longer a specific day of the week. Our Sabbath is in Christ. So if you are in Christ and he is in you, his rest can happen at any day, anywhere, not just at temple on a Saturday. The Lord's rest can be with you, whatever, wherever, as long as you honor him with your time and say, Lord, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. What does it do? It sets us in a pattern of accepting the Lord's provision for how he created us, right? It's a gift of grace that you don't have to work. The Lord's saying, stop working. Isn't that a good thing? It's a grace to us. As we saw, it restores your body, allows you to recuperate so that you can then, on the first day of the week, go out and be a good servant. Serving the Lord with all of your strength, all of your mind, all of your heart, all of your whole being. And it forces you to close your mouth and focus on the Lord for a little bit. On your Sabbath days, by the way, don't pack it with the news. Don't pack it with family drama. Don't pack it with things that will grieve your spirit. Don't pack it with to-do lists or honey-do lists. Pack it with Jesus. Pack it with fellowship. Pack it with sermons. Pack it with food. Pack it with something good. Breaking of bread, it's good. Break bread with your family. Sit down, have a meal. Focus on the Lord and slow down a bit. I believe the Lord, I believe that commandment to keep a Sabbath still stands. Just as the rest of the Ten Commandments are part of normal Christian behavior, so it is part of normal Christian behavior to give to God what he asks of you. Whether that's on a Saturday or a Wednesday, doesn't matter. Give him something. It's all his anyway. Give the Lord that which is his, your time, your body, your heart, your attention. So I do believe we need to reestablish a pattern of Sabbath in our lives as a means of honoring God, but not for the sake of fulfilling the law like the Seventh-day Adventist does. Not to say that this is the only way to please God. No, Christ's blood pleased God. It pleased him to crush his son for us. There is nothing you can do more than that that will please the Father. Nothing. Nothing. But be obedient, because obedience is better than sacrifice. So those workaholics who like to fill their days off with things, take a day off. That's really how I see this Sabbath issue. Take a day off. Allow the Lord to minister to your heart and grant you rest. Doesn't the Lord say, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden? Weary from what? Working. Heavy laden from what? Burdens. Come to him and he will give you rest, Sabbath, comfort. If you don't come to him and you're saying, I'm so burdened, I'm so weary, I'm so bogged down by this world. He's like, if you come to me, you get rest. That's the deal. And saints, I can't tell you how many times I've gone without taking like a Sabbath day, without taking time away with the Lord. and You just get tired. Yes. Now, as a pastor, I don't do much physical work, but we get very spiritually and emotionally tired throughout the week. Sometimes I just need to sit. I just need to veg. I just need to eat a good meal. 
I need to pray. I need to worship. I need to put on some J.D. Farag or some Tim Delina or something. Yeah, one of my favorite pastors on and sit back and be poured into. If we're so heavy laden, yet the Lord promises us rest, then you know the solution to your problem. Go to him. He is your rest. Spend time with him. Give him the Sabbath. Let him be the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, that's the practical application. And I believe that should be the behavior of Christians. Just like baptism doesn't save you, but we should obey and be baptized. In the same manner, taking a Sabbath doesn't save you, but we should obey and take a Sabbath. While that is all well and good, and we've established that should be a behavior pattern and God has provided for it, I believe there's something deeper going on here. I don't think the Lord just took the seventh day off to tell us we need to take the seventh day off. I think there's a pattern here. It's a pattern we need to see. Colossians chapter 2 says something very interesting to us. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. It talks about legalism and the fulfilling of the law. Verse 11, it says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision that is made without hands, by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcisions of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised through him, uh, with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you of all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, which is the Ten Commandments, the law, by the way. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or in the regarding of a festival or of new moons or of Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is of Christ. What on earth does that verse mean? He goes on and starts by saying, listen, circumcision does not save you. It indicted you. Baptism does not save you. It is a symbol of you being buried with Christ. And the uncircumcision of your flesh, which was an indictment against you, and the law that indicted you, all that indicted you, was nailed to the cross. Even the principalities who condemned you were made a public spectacle when Christ raised from the grave. Nothing that can condemn you has the right to condemn you because Christ has justified you. And then he says, so let no man with their religiosity condemn you because Sabbaths are simply a shadow of things to come. How does that fit in? And again, of things to come. This is Paul, New Testament, after Christ came and raised from the grave. We know that Jesus is our Sabbath. But when he says there are a shadow of things to come, this is after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. That means it's yet future to Paul. Hasn't happened yet. The Sabbath shadow hasn't happened. Well, what is a shadow? A shadow is not a substance. A shadow is when light is blocked by a certain thing. And that thing is the substance, but the shadow that casts lets you know you are behind it or you are heading towards it. A shadow of things to come. Is this saying to us that the Sabbath day is pointing to something future? Second Peter chapter three says this to us. Second Peter chapter three, verse eight and nine says, but beloved, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There is a principle here that is also echoed in the Psalms that to the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Now, we talked about how 
people who believe in theistic evolutionists take this verse to try to pack millions of years into each day of creation. That's not what it's saying because it's thousand, not million. But to the Lord, the days are as a thousand years. Is it possible that the six days of creation and the seven day of rest is a prophetic outline of human history in advance? Is that possible? Because the Sabbath is something yet to come. It's a shadow of something yet to come. And days are as a thousand years to the Lord. Each day of creation, I believe, is a pattern of a thousand years of human history ending in the millennial reign, the thousand years of global and final Sabbath for the earth, which is called the day of the Lord. A day is as a thousand years. Is it possible that the Sabbath day is also a type and a shadow of the thousand year millennial reign, which again is why we put such importance on believing in a six literal day creation. Because if the Lord is setting up a pattern, but those aren't literal days, it's just millions and millions of years. What does that do to the millennial reign? Is it just millions and millions of years? Or is the Lord setting a pattern? And I do not believe there is anything incidental in the Bible. I believe everything is intentional. This is what's called the millennial day theory. And I personally hold to it. It is not doctrine in the sense that you have to believe this to believe to be a Christian, but it's something I want to share with you because I think it will give us understanding as to where we are in human history. If you could bring up slide number one, I want you to take a look at this. Technically speaking, we're in the year 6,000 since creation, right around there. There's a lot of debate between certain calendars from the Essenes, from the traditional Hebrews, from the Gregorian calendar, whether it's a solar or a lunar calendar. I believe the, the, the imprecise nature of us not being able to get an exact date and time since creation is intentional. That way we cannot know the day or the hour, but we'll know the sign or the season, right? But look at this. There were six days of creation and the seventh day was rest. If you believe the biblical narrative, there has been 6,000 years since creation, 4,000 up to Jesus. And then we count from Jesus to 2022, which we live in now. So about 6,000 years total. Now, I'm not going to tell you it was 440 B.C. when when Adam and Eve were created. You know what I mean? Um, A lot of people say they know that Adam was created in the afternoon because it was just before Eve. (laughs) Badum ching. Right. Right. But we don't we can't get that specific with a date. But there's a pattern that says, but beloved, be not ignorant. One thing. And and, and by the way, this there's a lot in Scripture that says that man, human history is allotted a certain amount of time that the Lord has assigned the times of man. Is it possible that he assigned 7000 years to man and each millennium, each 1000 years corresponds or is foreshadowed? by the creation days. Let's keep this up there. Let's think about day one. Day one, if you look at this calendar, goes from Adam and Eve to about Enoch and Noah. There's some disagreement, but to about Enoch and Noah when the flood was about to happen or when it was prophesied. It's about a thousand years from them. Now, what was created on the first day? Light, and it was separated from darkness. What happened within those first thousand years? Man fell. They were separated from God. Within that first thousand years, it went from light to darkness. So the creation day corresponds with what happened in that first thousand years. Day two, from Noah to about Abraham, the second thousand years that we talk about. Noah to about Abraham, some people, again, some discrepancy. I'm not trying to be exact or set a date. But what happened in the day two of creation? The waters above were separated from the waters below, creating the firmament or the atmosphere with a canopy. And what happened within the second thousand years of human history? The flood, the waters that were above the canopy came down. But also the canopy was laid for protection. And what happened to the eight people who were on the ark? They were protected and preserved. And what happened when Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees? The messianic line was protected 
and preserved. The second day, protection, preservation, and the flood, the waters happen. Day three is about in human history, the third thousand year section from Abraham to about David or Solomon, right around the time that the temple was built. This is the third thousand years of human history. What was created on the third thousand years? Land. Right. The waters were separated and land came forth and not only land, but vegetation. Well, what do we see in that third thousand years, starting with Abraham? The seed of the Messiah going from being a small seed with one man, Abraham and his wife, to going to be a nation, a full nation that came out that would go into their own land. Establish it, build a temple within that third thousand years mimicking or fulfilling the type of what happened on the third day. The fourth day is from about Solomon or David to Christ. That fourth thousand year section that you see butting up against when Christ comes on the scene. And what was created on the day four of creation? The heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon. During that time from David to Jesus, it's packed with the majority of the prophets that would tell forward the signs and the seasons of the Messiah's arrival. And what were the constellations there for? Signs and seasons. And more importantly, what was the culmination of that fourth day of human history, that 4,000 year grouping? The sun would come just as the sun was formed on day four. Day five, we have from Christ up to what we now know as the Dark Ages. We now know as the Dark Ages, about 1000 AD after Christ. And that is what's known as the church age or the beginning of the church age. Now, on day five in creation, what was created? The fish and the birds. What did Jesus promise to make Peter? Fishers of men. And within that first thousand years, the gospel went forth and the nets were full. But at the same time, it ended in the dark ages where the birds of the air came and sat upon the branches of that great tree that grew out of the seed that was planted by the gospel. And idiomatically speaking throughout scripture, birds of the air, and birds are good, they're, they're, they're okay, they're, they're not demonic in and of their own nature, but they're used idiomatically as a type of demons, of satanic entities. So here on the fifth day, we have the fish, we have the birds, and within the first thousand years, you have nets full with those who would hear the gospel message, but at the same time, the dark ages where the church became a sore upon society and tried to empower through demonic practices. And we went in in depth with that with the seven letters to, to the churches in the book of Revelation. Now, day six, the dark ages from about 1000 AD to roughly about where we are right now on this timeline, 2000 years after Christ, the dark ages to now. What happened on day six of creation? Animals, creeping things, beasts of the field, and man and woman became one. Think this through with me. The gospel would then spread after the Reformation, after we went back to salvation by grace through faith, and great evangelists would rise up and go into all the Gentile nations, which idiomatically used in the book of Daniel, diversity of animals are used as Gentile nations. So the gospel message would go into the Gentile nations like the beasts of the field. But it ends with the bride being taken by the groom. Adam and Eve on day six, two became one on the sixth day of creation. And God said it was very good. And here we are 2,000 years after Christ, 6,000 years after creation, in the sixth day in the prophetic pattern of creation, waiting for our groom to return. Saints, if this is a pattern... 
of all of human history in advance. And we've seen this before, by the way. The Lord likes giving history in advance, does he not? Is that not the thing he says makes him different from all the other gods that he prophesies things that are not and they come to pass as though they are? Didn't we not see in Revelation chapter two and three a whole seven phased history in advance of the church age? The Lord loves doing that. Now, if we are close to the bride and groom becoming one, that seventh day would be filled with what's called the millennial reign, obviously with seven years in between, the great tribulation, a bit of an overlap. But that seventh year would fit, the, or the seventh thousand year would fit the pattern, the shadow of the Sabbath day where the earth would rest under the righteous rule of Christ and his saints for a thousand years in Garden of Eden conditions. Saints, if this is the pattern the Lord was setting up, how close are we to the Sabbath day? How close are we to the Sabbath thousand years? We are close to the millennial reign, saints. Colossians 2 said, the Sabbath is a shadow of things to come. Hosea, by the way, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, uh, states from a Jewish perspective that the Jews would be buried for two days and on that third day the Lord would rise them up again, speaking, I believe, prophetically of Jesus going to the grave and rising on the third day, but also of the time where the Jews would be temporarily abandoned by God as a nation only to be picked up and raised during the great tribulation so that they would be preserved during the millennial reign. That's Hosea chapter one verse, uh, ver uh, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. It says there's two days between when they're abandoned and when they're raised. Now, just, just some more. Just, this is not something I've contrived, by the way. Both, it, both Ignatius and Polycarp, who were disciples of John, who wrote the Revelation, held to this view. They believed that God established 7,000 years for human history and that the 1,000th year millennial reign on the 7,000th year of human history was going to be a Sabbath for all mankind. The Essenes, which is who John the Baptist used to roll with, which were a sect of Jews who believed that they were more right according to Scripture than the Pharisees, which they were, by the way. And people are saying, well, what happened to the Essenes? Well, once Christ came on the scene and, and, and filled all of the prophecies they were waiting for, they joined. They're all Christians. John the Baptist's disciples all went with Jesus to be his disciples. They all believed in this prophetic pattern of the seventh day of creation. Irenaeus held this view. Hippolytus said, and this is an interesting quote, uh, the, the, he's one of the early church fathers, the Sabbath is a type and symbol of the future kingdom of the saints when they shall reign with Christ after he comes from heaven, as John says in his revelation. And then he quotes, for a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. The majority of ancient Hebrew rabbis held to the view that the six days of creation were a pattern of 6,000 years assigned to man and the Sabbath would be a millennial reign where the Messiah would come and rule and reign over the earth. Most Hebrew and Gentile ancient calendars all put the current date that we live in at about 6,000 years from creation. Not just Jewish, but across the whole world, ancient, ancient Mayan calendars, ancient Chinese calendars, ancient African calendars, ancient Native American calendars all put our current day at about 6,000 years since creation. And again, I believe the discrepancies where, regarding those things where they don't align 100% is purposeful. I believe it is purposeful. If this pattern is accurate, the days of creation equal a thousand years of human history in foreshadow. How close is our Sabbath then? Look at this calendar. We are at 2022. More than 2,000 years since Christ was born, a couple years shy of when he was crucified. How close are we? Can we say he's coming soon? Can we say our Sabbath is close, closer than it's ever been according to this calendar? 
More importantly, if the rapture of the church happens before the seven-year Great Tribulation and before the thousand-year millennial reign, then how much closer is the rapture of the church? Saints, I could only put it in one, in one phrase. It's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. By the way, this gives new meaning to Matthew chapter 12, verse 8, where Jesus says, The son of the man, a son of man is the Lord even over the Sabbath. What's going to happen in the millennial reign? He's going to rule and reign as Lord during the Sabbath year. Saints, I believe this is a pattern that we need to at least consider given the hour that we live in, given the vast amount of prophecies that are fulfilled, being fulfilled within our time, within our lifetime. Why is this important? Why, I think, is this important to us right now? Because a lot of us need a Sabbath. A lot of us are tired and weary this earth, as it says in Romans chapter 8, groans and pains. Ooh, like that. Wow. Oh, I couldn't have planned that any better. It's all right, Ian, I got this audio. We'll record this. The earth groans and pains for his return. The earth is fed up. The animals are fed up. I, f I saw a gang of birds in front of Majestic Hot Dog scrapping. They were sitting there yelling at each other in a circle like it was some kind of battle rap cipher. It was crazy. They're fed up. They're looking at the world. They're like, you guys did this to us. The animals, the earth is reeling with more earthquakes per year in a higher mag magnitude than any period in recorded history. Sabbath has to come soon. Sabbath has to come sooner rather than later. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13. We see this church in Philadelphia. The end times church that is doing the will of the Lord. Not the end times church that is wasting their time and thinks they need nothing. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, to the angel in the church of Philadelphia, write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no, one's open, no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, but have kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of, synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them to come worship at your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my commandment to persevere. I will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test all those who dwell upon the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven and my, uh, from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Saints, I see what's going on in this world. I see how many of our own flock is diagnosed with scary diseases and illnesses. I see how much of us are struggling with depression, how much of us we just need rest. Sabbath is coming soon. It's right around the corner. It's near. I can't give you a date. I can't give you an hour, but I can tell you we are in the sign and the season of the Sabbath. The cry of the church, as it says in the end of the revelation, is, Lord, come quickly. The spirit and the bride says, come. Saints, are you saying, Lord, come quickly? Or are you saying, Lord, delay for a little while longer? That'll tell you whether you're of the spirit or of the bride. 
Are you saying hold off or are you saying come quickly? I don't know about y'all, but I can use the Sabbath. There's more support for this view. I urge you guys to take a look at it, but let it be known that we are in the signs. We are in the times of the signs and the Lord is coming quickly and he will give us rest in him. Amen. Amen. But until then, until then, find your rest in Jesus Christ. If you are weary, run to him because you don't need a day in order to get rest. You need a person and the person, as Ephesians says, is our peace. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Lord, that your return is right around the corner. And I pray that as we see this sixth day of creation laying out a pattern for us, that we would long, just like the rest of all of creation longs, to see your arrival. Take us home. But until then, Father, may we work while it is yet day. May we be found with our hands to the plow and with oil in our lamps. May we be worshiping you with such intensity that if we had our eyes closed here singing songs and we opened our eyes there singing holy songs, it would be a seamless transition, Father. Fill us with your spirit in these hours and may we be found about our Father's business in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.